Welcome to the Press One for Nick podcast. My name is Nick Glimsdahl, and my guest this week is Nathan Foy. Nathan is the founder and CEO of Fortis. They provide over 25,000 private secure trips in 114 countries per year to clientele worth more than a half a trillion dollars. Trillion with a T. Uh, Fortis offers ground transportation to more private jet owners than any other service in the world. Nathan, welcome to the Press One for Nick podcast. Thank you, Nick. Good to be here. Yeah, so I ask every single guest at the very beginning, uh, what's one thing people might not know about you? Well, I came prepared. Uh, so uh, one thing I was going to share that not a lot of people know is uh, I spent a semester studying in Scotland when I was in college. And Scotland was unique in the sense that we had a four week spring break, which I've never heard anybody else having. Uh, and we actually a group of friends and I made that into five weeks and we toured Europe for five weeks. This was uh, my junior year in college. And I was basically the captain for the whole trip. I was listening to people. Where did they want to go? What did they want to experience? How did they want to, to do Europe? And uh, that's really where I kind of caught the bug for arranging travel in a way that coordinates all the details and makes it all come together and uh, found that I enjoyed it. And uh, I've been kind of on that horse ever since. Awesome. Yeah. So you got this book called what, Cl what rich clients want, but won't tell you. Uh, so give my listeners maybe a glimpse, glimpse into your clientele. We talked about the, the trillion with the T, but what's that criteria for to be a client of yours? Well, so most of our clients are doing what we call secure private travel. So that means that they are flying via a private jet, usually that they own. And then they use Fortis to handle chauffeurs and security arrangements so that really the service on the ground mirrors the service that they get in the air. Uh, and so um, what I wrote the book about was just to say that over the 21 years we've been in business, I think we've deconstructed really a, a cycle, a process that can be implemented really by anybody doing service. It doesn't have to just be for rich people, but through the pressure cooker of the work that we've done, it's kind of a way to take you and even lead your clients into a higher level of service than they would even ask for. One of the things that we've found over time is they don't actually tell you what they want. It's not really worth their time. They just fire people until they find what they want. So even with the clients and relationships that we've had over two decades, it's really just A-B testing. That's kind of led me into uh, to this process of discerning what they want. And my book was uh, meant to share that with people and uh, hopefully tell some fun stories along the way. Absolutely. I think it's so interesting on how it plays a parallel between what these rich clients want but won't tell you, but at the same time, like how that aligns with that personalized, the hyper-personalized customer experience. And just, uh, they almost are, are the fortune tellers of what other customers are going to be asking for, uh, just because of what they're expecting at a different level on that personalization. And so keeping an eye on what these guys are doing, uh, guys and gals are doing are, is, is so important. But I got a boatload of questions, so I'm not going to geek out about that for, um, you know, I guess for, you know, how do the affluent people think differently than the, the people that are not affluent? Well, I think, I think the, the value of their time in knowing that their most precious commodity is time and it's not even close is, is really a first key insight. So when we have new hires on our team at Fortis, we train them not to do what you would want done for you in that circumstance, but you kind of have to put on the persona of uh, a super high achieving, ultra high net worth individual to say, if it's a couple hundred bucks extra to get this extra thing, but it buys them time, it buys them accomplishment, success, they're gonna go for that every time. And so it really just takes a lot of repetitions for that to really seep into your bones because at the end of the day, our team leaves work here and we're normal people. You know, We think like normal people and we have the same cost benefits that normal people do, but the clients we serve don't and we have to adapt to that. That it was it was interesting in the book you were talking about how the, the higher up that you get you kind of start wearing a three piece suit you start wearing you know dressing crazy uh, really expensive clothes and then the higher up you get the, the kind of at towards the peak you start dressing at a little bit lower the 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 vest or the the you know less 
less formal. And so when you showed up, I think it was uh, somewhere in Asia, I might be totally botching this, but somewhere in Asia, you showed up and you were dressed to the nines and this person who you were interacting with was not not even close to that. So it, tell me more about that real quick. Well, it's uh, you're right. It, it was in Asia. That was in Hong Kong. Um, the, the 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 bit that I key off of in the book, Adam Carolla has a, uh, uh, a story that he talks about where basically at the very low end and the very high end, the, the ultra rich and the very poor, they both don't wear a tie and uh, they don't have any cash on them. And they're always asking people to drive them around. Um, and so it's almost kind of like there's this complete convergence that happens. And yeah, the, the higher net worth someone gets, uh, typically, now there's some, there's some that, that are exceptions to this, but the typical thing is the more they don't want to stand out, the more they want to fit in and not be known for their money, not make a huge display of that. So that story that you're referencing from the book, I go to the penthouse of the Bank of China Tower in Hong Kong, and I'm meeting with this principal, very, very high net worth. When you go to Hong Kong, everyone hands you their business card with two thumbs and they do a slight bow when they hand it to you. And this was the first time the guy handed me his card casually with two fingers. He had, you know, a shirt that was uh, two buttons unbuttoned and, you know, a, a loafers with no socks. And uh, it was the Adam Carolla story coming to life. It's so interesting. I'm going to have to go watch that bit uh, of Adam <laughs> Carolla now tonight. Uh, so you talked about saving time as kind of the most important resource because that's something that we actually don't get back. But uh, with great service, is it enough for your clientele to just get great service or do they de demand more outside of that time? Uh, you have to earn the right to, I think, kind of lead them into time maximization. So that doesn't happen right away. I mean, the very first level on what I call the skyscraper of success, those levels that take you up, uh, is professionalism. And that involves a look. It involves a demeanor. It involves a confidence and one thing that ultra high net worth clients uniformly do is that they size you up in 20 seconds or less. And if they don't think you're worth your time, if you don't pass that 20 second eye test, you're not going to have the ability to lead them into anything more. So we've, with uh, 6,000 chauffeurs around the world, we've really kind of systematized coaching up guys in different nations, different cultures on how to win that first 20 seconds. Because if you don't, really nothing else matters so with that in mind i think i think of a dog walking by somebody and, and sniffing them so it's completely inappropriate but how do you get past that sniff test for those perspective you know so you want to be you want to do the things your mom taught you to do right like you want to have good posture and have good eye contact and the firm handshake but i think there's a there's a confidence from competence that just exudes, I've got this all under control. And that's more of a sensory thing than anything else. Uh, and if people feel that, then they are put at ease. Uh, so you wanna be kind of your own force field and not just key off of their force field because they have all kinds of people that beckon to them and defer to them and actually even fuss over them. They typically don't want that. They actually want to be led by experts that are confident in what they're doing. So interesting. Um, so when it comes to the the clientele, I'm sure there's a ton of similarities uh, of each one, and, and uh, we could talk about uh, what those are. But you know, I guess what do they have in common first, and then maybe what are some of the differences? So the the, the value of their time is extremely uh, important to them. Uh, they want to be led, but they want you to earn the right to lead. So. They don't want you to ask questions, even about what's your preferred drink or what do you prefer the temperature to be? They want you to notice how they respond to different search situations and then you calibrate accordingly. And then they're highly attuned to, oh, you picked up on that. I drink Diet Coke and I came out of the car and it was half empty and now I have a new cold Diet Coke. You didn't ask for it. You didn't even pat yourself on the back that you did it. You just did it. Those are the little things that they notice that actually earns your right to lead them into a higher level of service. But if you, if you make a big show of that, uh, they actually will repel on that. And that's one thing, even when people reach the highest levels of service, 
we still coach them. You're not his friend. Uh, he, he doesn't really want to kick back and hang out with you. And you can't just kind of deconstruct all the things that you're doing. You still have to have that veil of professionalism, uh, even when you've earned the right to leave. What do you call that? So the people that you hire who are paying attention to what they're, what they're wearing, what they're looking at, what they have in their hand, uh, is that active listening according like a Chris Voss would say, or is it something else? Uh, it's active noticing. So uh, in the book, I talk about basically, especially if it's a first time client and you're chauffeuring, let's say you're chauffeuring the, the principal all day. Every stop, you want to be making voice memos to yourself about what you're noticing and what you're picking up, because on the eighth hour or the tenth hour, you won't remember the things that you noticed in the AM when you picked up the principal. Uh, and then you want to take that and distill that and make that into something that's now, okay, this is the baseline. If you're doing the next day's work, now I'm actually building on top of this. So you really, it begins with a mindset, Nick, where you have to say, this is a craft. I own what I'm doing. This is my own business. And I'm going to do this in a way that's really kind of unique to what I notice and what the principal needs. If you view it as a job, you'll never even enter this mental space where you can start to progress up the skyscraper. You touched on trust a couple times. Uh, what happens when a client trusts you? Uh, when a client trusts you, the ironic thing is, is I think that the, the stereotype is, is that when you're serving ultra high net worth, a billionaire, uh, he's never going to trust you. He wants, uh, you know, the, the hunchback of Notre Dame just saying yes, master, you know, to everything he, he has a whim about. Um, the, the ironic thing is, I think there's no one that's more wanting to trust if you earn it than an ultra high net worth principal, because they are playing offense in a very big way. And if you can help them to achieve more of what they want to achieve, they'll never leave you. You know, uh, at the beginning of COVID, there was the, uh, the Last Dance series about Michael Jordan and the 90s Bulls, his last season. Uh, and he hired a trainer named Tim Grover, who's in the, in the documentary. And Tim Grover, famously, Jordan gave him 15 days. I'm sorry, he gave him 30 days to, uh, to set up a regimen for him to train. And 15 years later, he was still Jordan's guy when he retired. Um, and that's, that's the mindset is like Tim Grover proved his worth. And then that trust never left until Jordan retired. Is it, is that all it's about? Is it just trust or is there more? Oh, there's a lot more. Uh, so in the, the, the second level beyond professionalism is that you want to learn problem solving. So this is taking the regular problems that a client faces and say, I know that in the bell curve of what's most likely to happen, these things are things I should have a plan in advance for. So, um, you know, we have a story in the book about there's a prince, there's a chauffeur in Miami who has a magic toolkit inside of his console for things that clients may not know that they need until they land. And then all of a sudden they realize they need. And so it's just a small thing, but he saves 15, 30 minutes for clients all the time when they arrive. Then you want to move into concierge. And with concierge, now you are kind of conducting the orchestra as opposed to just playing the instrument. Uh, and what I mean is that you have a network of alliances that you pull on so that you can coordinate more than you could do by yourself. And that requires the ability to see around corners, see where you can create value for even unspoken needs with alliances. Then the next level is security. Security is basically a lot of times where that trust comes in because it's not just trusting you to provide security, but it's trusting you to do that in a way that doesn't sacrifice the service. There's a lot of really great security professionals out there, but I think the one thing you have to watch out for with those kinds of folks is a lot of times they ultimatize security and you're not actually able to achieve what you need to achieve right? It's like, it's still all got to fit together. I call it the dad service, working with the mom service. My dad always made sure I had oil changes and tires inflated, right? That's the security. But it turns out, you know, people still want the concierge when they go to the hotel. And then the final one is legendary. That's when it's all working together. 
and you push out the boundaries on what's even possible so that it's more than the client can imagine. And that's when it's all working together. And frankly, you have a client that will never leave you and your premium is at the highest level in your industry. That's, it's so interesting on how you can continue to align that with customer experience though. Like how do you continue to find ways to add value, seeing around corners and add these little toolkits to help people save even 30 seconds? Like what's 30 seconds or a minute or five minutes to somebody when they're on a, a, a chat or a self-service or uh, inside a customer service where they call you back? Like there's so much opportunity there to solve that problem and look around the corner and drive efficiencies to create that better experience. And I think the same is true with based off of the book that, you know, that, that you wrote is there's so much loyalty around that if you're able to solve the things that are important to them at that right time. I think you're absolutely right. So uh, we have a concept here in our headquarters uh, called Challenges Welcome. It's one of our core values. And the, the idea is, is that you, don't, you can't pull off everything a client asks you to do. You can't do it in, in, at a level of service that you wanna always put your name on. That's just reality. But you can always welcome the challenging ask in a way that makes them feel more intimate with you so that they'll ask you for the craziest things imaginable. And the really cool thing is, is that when you earn that level of intimacy with your clients, you start to see common things, common challenges that they face. And that ends up creating the new service offerings that help you to push out the boundaries of what's possible. Absolutely. So you mentioned in the book that your ability to adapt to changes, adopt the right solutions and solve problems rapidly will largely determine your future success. Is that something you had to learn? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, one of the stories I cite is uh, we had a principal who's, who's a great client of ours to this day, a Chilean banker. Uh, he always travels to a city. He has his wife had a car, he's in a car, and then his chief of staff is sometimes with him or uh, sometimes in his own car. And they all arrive in Boston. It's four days of three cars all day. It's a big job. And 20 seconds in, he fires the chauffeur. And he literally, I think he started Ubering. And we got no report. We got no understanding of what went wrong. And I had to basically deconstruct and reverse engineer what went wrong. This was many years ago, but actually this was the inspiration for the 22nd test. Um, but again, he never did a Zoom call with me and said, Nathan, here's what I assess people on in 20 seconds or less. I just deconstructed it, started applying it and started to gauge how well the clients responded to it. And it, you know, it's still being tweaked. It's, you know, the, the beauty of this process is it's never, ever. So intense, like, you know, I guess finish the high level story uh, of what, what was the end result of that? Cause I know based off of the book, it wasn't that you just let it go and say, oh, I reverse engineered that. And I knew what that problem was. Um, tell me, tell me the end of that story. And then uh, I'll let everybody else read the rest of the book for, for the other nuggets. Sure. So this, uh, this client, his, uh, his chief of staff called us during COVID, during the, the slowest part of the travel time post-pandemic. And uh, he asked us a few questions, but then he just made it known. He said, hey, if you guys need anything financially to keep going, uh, a loan or an investment, let us know because you're that vital to the success of our principal that we will do whatever it takes for you to maintain. Now, of course, we're fine and they're fine and all of that, but they went from somebody that fired us in less than 20 seconds to, uh, to someone that was willing to financially get involved just to make sure that we were doing well. Uh, so that's, that's, I think the power of, uh, you know, kind of tweaking these things over time and developing elite service. Yeah. What was the thing that you just mentioned before that, uh, about the challenge? What, what was your saying in, in house? Uh, we call it challenges welcome. So uh, the idea is that if you ask me for something that's really out there and I just give you a little sigh or maybe a slight shrug, I'm creating distance between us. And you start to think, am I being unreasonable? Am I being a jerk here? I'm just, I just thought I'd ask you if you could do that, right? As opposed to if I just said, Nick, thank you for asking me. 
to see if we can do that. Let's roll up our sleeves and see what we can do. Can I get back with you in 10 minutes on what's possible? I didn't promise you I was going to do it. I just welcomed your challenge in a way that you just said, hey, you know, Nathan's a good guy. I think Nathan really wants to make this happen for me. And I was asking him for something that's pretty out there. And so that's going to make me lean into them the next time I have something that's out there. And, uh, and that ends up creating a lot more intimacy. Okay. A no kind of doors, but a, I'm not sure. Let me think about it and see how I can potentially help you changes the mindset of the person that you're interacting with. And I think you hit it right on the head. And I think going back to the book again is you talk about taking on clients or potential clients that are hard to please. And I think a lot of companies dismiss that, that a potential clients, they will won't work with the ones that you, they think are potentially hard to please, but you in, in, in instead encourage the companies to take on the difficult clients. Why is that? Because it's the ultimate stress test to see if we're actually providing that elite legendary service level that we strive for. Uh, so we had a principal a few years ago, uh, and I mean, he's traveling to Italy. He had 30 security personnel on his trip to Italy. Uh, very demanding. And not only demanding in terms of personal needs last minute, but privacy for this principal was very important. And so there was a lot of sub accounts in every sub account. The emails and the contact info was different than the other sub accounts. And if you didn't route it correctly, it could have been a huge deal. And uh, I told the team at the end of that, I said that the most important thing was not what his level of spending is or you know how much, how much profit we made on him. The most important thing is we've never been tested, you know, all 12 cylinders of the Ferrari to see what can it really do when it's absolutely got to perform. And this was the first client that really opened up all 12 cylinders. And, uh, and it was nice to know, uh, you know, the car did pretty well on the track and I thanked him for challenging us that way. Uh, if it's kind of like forging steel, you'll, you, you'll bend it enough, you'll either break or it'll get stronger. And, uh, you know, I think that's the, that's my, my mental like performance test. Like how do I, how do I kind of mold myself and bend it enough where I'm either going to learn or I'm going to grow. Right. And, um, you know, I, I like that one thing that you talk about was a high performance mindset. So when it comes to my listeners, how can they adopt that, that mindset? Well, so you begin with looking at it as a craft, as we talked about, and I think then you become a student of the game. And so the minute you start to think that you've figured things out and that you have attained a certain level of status is the minute that you should be the most concerned about your service, uh, because we're all figuring it out. It's always changing. Uh, and so you want to look at people that might be more advanced than you in the field and frankly, ask for mentorship. Uh, or maybe take elements of different people and build your own composite of a mentor of people that you can learn from. Uh, you have to totally disabuse yourself of the idea that no news is good news. That, that's, you know, as Nick Saban would say, that's rat poison um, because that they will never tell you that. Um, so you have to have higher metrics that you're looking for. And if, for instance, at Fortis, we spend an incredible amount of time getting about 20 to 25 principal surveys filled out directly on an iPad each year. I mean, we stalk this like it's Ocean's Eleven to find the right chauffeur. The guy has finished his trip. He's on his way back to the airport, but it's an early enough hour. We think he would actually respond. It's a 30 second survey. It's all on one page on an iPad, but we spend all year trying to get that 20 to 25 sample set because it's the only core sample of truly how we're doing. And if we ever thought that we had figured it out, we would stop doing that, but we're, we're more relentless than ever on getting that information. It's, it's so interesting. Just think if everybody else in, in corporate America was trying to find the right perfect time for their chauffeurs or tier threes of customer service, pushing out the right survey at the right time to get 25 surveys. That's a, uh, it's pretty crazy. But um, so we talked about your clientele and, and the importance of the jobs that they do. Um, how would the world suffer? I guess that's a good question. Like how would the world suffer if Fortis failed to do your job? If you failed, how would the world suffer? 
So the people that we serve are the world's biggest envelope pushers. So in the book, I go through, you know, the profile of a typical Fortis client is someone that has a net worth of over $600 million that usually owns not only a private jet, but usually more than one private jet. So it's not just someone that charters, they actually own their own plane. And these are the, the deal makers of the world. They're not just, they're almost never second or third generation wealth. They're actually the first generation that attained this wealth. So, um, you know, there's literally cases of major mergers that are going on that are, you know, top of the fold of the Wall Street Journal. And we did both principles transportation to go to the merger. Now, we didn't know that that's what they were doing. That's what we we're transporting them to. But then the next day when it's in the newspaper, we see, oh, that's what all that was about. This was this merger was finally announced and finalized at this thing. So those things have repercussions for thousands of employees, for thousands of jobs. And really, if you if you really deconstruct it, uh, my best estimate is maybe three to 5,000 people in the world would even qualify for uh, that level that we're talking about here. And so their economic impact, cultural impact uh, is huge for, for everybody that uh, comes into their contact. It's, uh, it's crazy to think about that. Uh, the amount of people that you would be impacted by if if something didn't go correct or or you created a bad experience, maybe that somebody had that bad taste in their mouth. And you're like, you know what? It doesn't feel right. I'm not doing this opportunity today. Now, that could have been a, a million or billion dollar deal uh, just on one transaction. So uh, very cool. So uh, Nathan, I wrap up every podcast with two questions. And the first one is, what book or person has influenced you the most in the past year? And, and focus on customer service or customer experience, uh, if you can. And then the second one is, if you could leave a note to all customer service professionals, it's going to hit everybody's desk Monday at 8 a.m. What would it say? So the, the book that's influenced me the most in the last year, and actually, I, I was inspired in many ways by this book to write the book that I wrote, What Rich Clients Want, is, uh, is John Wooden on leadership. So John Wooden's the famous UCLA basketball coach. I think he won 10 titles in 11 years at UCLA. Uh, but he has a pyramid of success traits that you have to have in the people in your organization for it to succeed. And he really thinks through this diligently, like one of them is industriousness. And he puts a definition, like what specifically do I mean by industriousness? And then he tries to, within that, align everybody that's got those character traits into their highest level of achievement that's in concert with the goals of the organization as a whole. And uh, it's funny you, you asked the question because... I had an intern last week at our Christmas party ask me, what's the best book on leadership I've read? And I said, I don't think you can do any better than John Wooden on leadership. Uh, because ultimately, that's what we're all trying to do. We're trying to find the right people, achieve organizational goals, and help them to maximize their individual potential. And uh, one of the things I love about the book, I mean, he coached Bill Walton. He coached Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And he lists his three favorite players that he ever coached and their names that you've never heard of. But he said, these three players got absolutely the most out of their potential. And that's what, they were the greatest successes because they got every ounce out of what was in them. And I love that. Uh, I do love that I too, would, because it's, how do you get the most optimal uh, out, of, out of your potential? Because I think, uh, you know, I, I ran in college and, and the one thing that my college coach always says is like, you can control you and you can control the things that you can do and put in your way to get past your potential or to meet your potential or not. And, um, you know, some people's potential is a lot higher than others. Uh, but some people uh, hit past another person's potential, even though that, others, that, that second person in line has a higher potential to where that is. And um, it, it comes down to, to effort and planning and, and tenacity. Yes, I, I love I love that. And it's, uh, it's fun to talk about in theory, right? But then like when you have the guy who's kind of mediocre, but he actually is getting everything out of what he has and you really value him and his role in the team, that's kind of really where you prove that you believe that, right? Um, so now the so, second question, yep. Uh, so, uh, what would I put on any customer service person's uh, 
a desk, I would say uh, what you do has an impact. Um, what you do is a reflection of your mission, vision, and values. And I think that good service today stands out more than anything in an atmosphere where every service that I use has degraded in the last two years. Uh, and so if you want to stand out in the workplace, you have a better opportunity now than ever, because if you actually take ownership of the client and their problems and take that to a deeper level, like you're going to stand out so much in today's economy that it's scary. So I just would encourage people with, there's a huge, huge market. If they can't find work that will reward them, call me, I'll be happy to hire them. Well said. You heard it here first. He is hiring the, the best and brightest. Uh, so um, I'm sure if you go to his uh, his page, he'll, you, you can apply anywhere as long as you think you're qualified. Um, Nathan, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you if they want to find you, if they want to buy your book? Uh, how do they get a hold of you? So what rich clients want is on Amazon, it's on Audible, it's on Barnes and Noble, all the places uh, you buy books. So um, it's uh, it's out there. And uh, I love not only people reading the book, but I love people interacting with me about the book. We've gotten some really great and interesting feedback from people in totally unrelated industries, uh, including a, a lawn and garden company here that's implemented it in their workforce. So I love all of that. Uh, Fortis is uh, Fortis.co. Um, there's uh, that's the information on, on Fortis as a company, and then my personal site is NathanFoy.com. Nathan, thanks so much. I had a blast, and I learned a ton. And uh, best of luck finding that next client and keeping and retaining them. Thank you, Nick. It's been a pleasure.